I think the beauty of Grand Army lies within the fact that the plot is very weak and very vague. A bomb goes off near a school and now we're following the lives of these students through the aftermath of the bomb going off. It's very vague, no substance, which is honestly so good because that allows more emphasis on the characters and how they interact with each other and how they change. You see, if the plot was more specific and complex, I don't know if there would be enough space for the characters and their individual storylines. The plot is very character dependent. The progression of the plot is revolving around the development and the actions of the characters. This means if they didn't have such well-written characters, the show would not be as good as it was. The way the show is written is in terms of how the characters interact with each other and really helps the show seem more realistic, as if Grand Army is an actual high school that one can attend. What makes the plot of this show stand out is that unlike other high school based shows which are always focused on one universal plot resulting in vague character subplots, this show goes more in depth about each character and their problems and motivations. Another great thing about the plot is that the writers don't shy away from having important discussions or portraying various topics and problems. These problems and topics are dragged out and resolved in a more timely and realistic manner compared to a show like Gronish, which usually tries to solve these hefty topics in under 20 minutes. What makes the plot of Grand Army so good is that nothing that the writers did is by mistake. Everything that is mentioned or portrayed is intentional for the progression of the story. No detail goes untouched or unwanted, which makes the story that more compelling. The show has really well-written characters. Each character plays an essential role in moving the story along. As in, if you take out a character, whether a main character or a side character, it will completely shift how each story turns out. And what I really liked about the characters was that the side characters were not just there, they weren't extras. They were either the antagonist or voices of reason for the main characters. And now we're going to get into the five main characters and their individual storylines and just my opinion. Dom is hands down my favorite character of the show, my comfort character. She's independent, hardworking, she doesn't take handouts, she cares about her family and is willing to sacrifice and do whatever it takes to make sure that they don't struggle. She has various side hustles such as braiding hair for others or selling hair products that she makes herself and she even has to quit basketball in order to make more time for her various side hustles and she has to keep up with homework and school on top of all of that. So when it came to the making of the decision of whether or not to go through with the arranged marriage in order for her family to make money, it was no surprise that Dom agreed to the arrangement. And that's what made me love and respect her even more, because this girl was willing to let go of her teen years and future just so her family won't have to struggle. If that doesn't deem your respect, I don't know what does. One of my favorite parts of Dom's storyline were her interactions with her friends and John Ellis. In my perspective, the way she acts with her friends versus at home or at her interview is a perfect example of how black youth have come accustomed to code switching consistently in life. If you're not familiar with the term code switching is when one has to change the way they talk or to adjust their accent to match the environment that they're in. The way she acts around her friends and John Ellis versus around her mom or other adults contrasts each other completely. So when both worlds collide at her birthday party, it's funny but also kind of awkward because her mom has never really seen that side of her because she's always kept it strong. But when it comes to the time where she's breaking down in front of her friends, it's weird for her friends because they've only seen her as strong. They've never seen her so vulnerable. Her friends are the kind of people that a person like Dom needs, a shoulder to cry on, and people to remind her that she needs to take a breather, and people to remind her that she needs to have fun. My favorite part of Dom's storyline was her and John Ellis's relationship. The reason why I love their relationship so much is that it's not every day that you see a black character who has a crush on someone but doesn't make it their whole personality or their reason for existence. John Ellis understood Dom. He realized how independent Dom was and instead of trying to overpower her with dominance, he was gentle with her and gave her a supporting shoulder, letting her do her thing but reminding her that he was there for her. But I think John got a little too comfortable with the idea of being dom's shoulder to lean on because then he offered her 300 dollars to help out her family 
which Dom took as an insult because she thought she finally found someone that understood her and understood that she wanted to be independent and be her own hero. Because I'm my own magical superhero superstar. Except lately I'm not. But instead, to her, it felt like he was trying to save her. But it all ended up working out in the end and they found a balance and they're going to prom. In my opinion, Dawn's storyline is the best one of the season because it beautifully tackles the reality of adultification, which is when a child is exposed to adult responsibilities. This is something that is very prominent in the black community among the youth and is often unavoidable at times. I've experienced adultification as the firstborn of an African household, but it was a fairly mild case, not as extreme as Dom's. So seeing this being portrayed on a screen made me feel seen and represented. The basis of Jason's storyline is not a story that is foreign to the media. Two black boys who have their future ahead of them play around and suffer a cruel punishment. What I liked about the storyline is that they didn't make Jason and Owen sports players like shows typically do. Instead, they made them classical musicians, which was nice to see because it shows how black boys can have other interests outside of athletics and rap. That's the kind of representation that young black youth need. My favorite part of Jason's storyline is the multiple inner and outer struggles that he has to face. The inner struggles being whether he should speak out and protest about how unfair he and Owen's punishment was or just stay silent and keep to himself. This is a struggle that many black youth have to deal with when facing racial discrimination and injustices that are present in the spaces they often find themselves in, such as sports and school and music. Although Jason's storyline is the most commonly portrayed, the way it is shown in Grand Army is very unique due to the different people that are telling him what to do. You have his grandfather and his friends telling him to speak up for what's right. And then you have his parents and music teacher and Owen himself that are telling him to not waste the opportunity that he has been giving. My favorite part of Jason's story is the ending scene, where we see him try and make the best of both worlds by playing part of his solo and ending it with the tape on his mouth and the fist in the air. Literal chills. I'm hyped to see what the outcomes of his actions will be because we know that it could go either way. He can either be praised for his stand or it could jeopardize how schools see him. By schools, I mean colleges. And we also have to worry about what Owen might think of this. Will Owen be mad at Jason? Will he resent Jason for making his problem some sort of social movement to help himself? Will he see Jason's acts as selfish or will he be proud of Jason? Will they rekindle their friendship that they have now lost? We won't know until we get a season two, so we better get a season two, people. But I genuinely enjoyed Jason's storyline. It obviously wasn't one of my favorites because it's something that I've seen a lot. But his interactions with people like Sonia ooh, CC, and Owen just made it even better. Just seeing him and Owen and John Ellis just hang around and just be teens just gives me that black boy joy that we've been looking for in the media. I hope to see more of Jason and Owen soon. So please let there be a season two. And hopefully... In season two, we can get a more in-depth look at Owen's storyline and what's going on with him in his new school. Because as you see in the visits that Jason has with Owen, his face is roughed up. He's getting be beaten up, which is a physical representation of the school-to-prison pipeline. And I think for a show that goes into heavy topics such as the school-to-prison pipeline, this would be a great opportunity for them to dive deeper into it. And it's something that a lot of us need to see and learn. In my opinion, Sid's storyline was the most complex, simply because of the fact that this man had so much going on. He had parents that were strict and wanted to keep his grades up and keep up their family image. He had the swim team on his back since he was the best swimmer there and he was also working hard to impress Harvard scouts. He had racist friends, his girlfriend, and struggling with the fact that he might be queer, which he later comes to terms with. In the beginning half of the show, Sid is writing an essay 
in which he talks about how hard it is to be Indian and a queer person, and how with all the pressure that he's holding, he feels like a ticking time bomb ready to explode, which he eventually does. And you're probably wondering, well, what was the fuse that lit him up? That was Orlov. You see, Orlov decided to get revenge on Sid, who called him a slur since he was a special education kid. Orlov went through Sid's computer and took pictures of the essay and uploaded it to Instagram. And Sid was angry, really angry, Spencer James angry. And rightfully so, because if I worked hard to keep a part of myself quiet and to myself because I wasn't ready to share with the world, I'd be angry that someone would expose me. If you want to hear more about the experience of coming out, I highly suggest checking out T Noir's videos and specifically her video that I'll link in the description. But in the end, Sid gets into Harvard and sort of comes to terms with who he is. I hope in the second season, the writers will go more in depth about his parents and their reaction to him coming out as queer. And also go more in depth about him and Flora and how their relationship pans out since, you know, they can't really be together anymore. And we can't forget about Victor. As for Sid and Victor, they give me Ander and Omar vibes, so I'm thinking that's the type of route that the writers are going to take. But I hope that they go slow because they really just got out of a huge fight. I, they need to work out their friendship because it's kind of toxic right now. But check out T Noir's video, she explains it perfectly. My favorite part of Sid's storyline was learning more about his sister. She is a very passionate feminist and does activism through visual and performing arts, hence the art exhibit. And her play she's very overprotective of her older brother especially when he comes out even though the relationship isn't perfect and seems very much love hate more hate than love the two always have each other's backs and they're always willing to stick up for each other and to be there for each other and that's what i love about their relationship it's realistic they're not perfect they fight they argue but they still love each other Mira is my second favorite character, and she isn't even a main one. Her character has so much potential for a great solo storyline in season 2 if there is one, so I'm really hoping that the writers pick up on that and make her one of the main characters. But before we get into Layla's storyline, let's appreciate this iconic Sid quote from the last episode. I almost forgot. I'm probably gonna never get in a cab with you fuckers again. Lord Uber. Who knows what the fuck you do? In my opinion, Layla's storyline is the weakest, because compared to the other storylines, it doesn't really touch on anything really heavy, but it's the most unique. She's a freshman who's starting high school with her best friend. She's struggling to find a place where she fits in. She can't depend on her best friend to give her attention because she's on the dance team. She can't talk to the other Chinese girls because she was adopted, so she doesn't know Chinese, and the other Chinese girls don't like her because she's whitewashed. When she starts to realize that she's not as special or as cool as she makes herself to be, she starts to become desperate. She seeks attention and approval from other people so that she can validate her own confidence. Why do you think she's so adamant on getting the lead role in Mira's play? She needs to be the center of attention so she can get that confidence boost. She also seeks attention from the disgusting but sadly somewhat attractive senior George, who doesn't even like her and uses her. What I hate about this whole situation is that through her on and off thing with George, she blamed Joey when she wasn't getting the attention that she wanted. Baby, Joey is not the reason why George doesn't like you. It is not Joey's fault that you have the same personality as a Lucky Charms box. No, that's too nice because a Lucky Charms box has way more personality than you love. So then we see Layla's final breakdown when she lets it all out to Rachel's rabbi. And after that final confrontation, she goes on a journey of gaining forgiveness from the ones that she's wronged. It was her redemption arc. It was her red table talk. But I really hated how all of this went down because she wasn't doing it because she actually felt bad. She was doing it because she thought that in order for her to regain her sense of power and control, she had to get people back on her corner. She was doing the right thing for selfish reasons. 
I think the reason why so many people hate Layla is because she suffers from victim mentality. She constantly believes that she is not at fault for most of the things that happen to her, even though there is literal evidence that she's at fault. Ma'am, we caught you in 4K! But all in all, Layla is the best written character. She's a, what a lot of young teens are. She's selfish. She suffers from main character syndrome. I mean, the girl saw a backpack on the train and kicked it off and felt like she was a hero. If that doesn't scream main character, I don't know what does. As a person of color that was raised American, she suffers from not being able to relate to her Chinese speaking peers. This is something that I'm pretty sure a lot of immigrant kids raised in America can relate to not being able to speak your home language and feeling a sort of disconnection from your own community. Although Layla's character is really bad now, she has so much more room to grow and improve in the coming seasons. I mean, again, she's a freshman. I'm pretty sure by senior year, she'll be a little bit more bearable. Let's start this section by saying Joey did not deserve anything that happened to her. She might not have said no, but she damn well didn't say yes. And for the guys to sit there and do that to her, as well as insult her and call her dry and easy, is so degrading and disgusting. I won't be putting a lot of clips of the cab scene, because that's a scene that can be a trigger for some people. But if you want to watch it, the show's free on Netflix. You just have to pay for the Netflix subscription. So yeah, if you want to watch it, then go ahead and check it out. Joy was my favorite storyline to watch simply for the way they perfectly set up her story and went about it they start her story off by showing who she was as a person how she was an activist and a feminist i mean her kneeling last minute during the national anthem which was performative don't get it twisted to getting a lot of girls in her school to participate in the free nipple movement they show her having fun and being out with her friends and tim showing how she cares about these people and has so much love and respect for them She's just a nice girl who loves to dance and advocates for women's rights. She doesn't like to be tied down until she starts things with Tim. Her and Tim seem to have a connection deeper than anything she's had with another person. So she wants to try it out, but her bestie Anna is not for the idea. And the reason why she's against the idea is because she doesn't want to be caught in the middle of them if they break up. But girl, why are you already thinking about their breakup? Why not support them for where they are right now? I really don't understand the whole I don't want my best friend dating my brother thing because like then who's gonna date him you like come on why are you being so possessive but in fear of losing Anna Joey decides to ghost Tim and chooses not to sit next to him at the theaters hoping that he gets the hint that they shouldn't be together and the poor guy's feelings are hurt fast forward they get into a taxi cab and that's when the essay happens for monetizational reasons and for the fear of not wanting my videos to be taken down, I'm not going to say the full phrase. Tim just sits there in silence, allowing it to happen because she's mad at Joey. Joey ghosted me, so I don't care. A classic example of a fragile male ego. Joey gets a rape kit and reports the boys for what they did, which is hard for her, considering the fact that these guys are her friends, her family. She thought they had her back. This whole event takes a toll on Joey physically, emotionally. She's completely drained. It's so traumatic that she has to move schools. And just seeing this portrayal of what SA victims have to go to just gave me a new perspective on how strong these people really are. At her new school, she meets another girl who suffered the same experience and expresses how much respect she has for Joey for speaking it out, which is something most victims of SA can't do because of how corrupt the justice system is. They set up Joey's character to show how she's popular and adored by many, yet still something tragic like this can happen, showing how common SA is and how it's just brushed off. Joey's storyline puts into perspective how hard it is to go through something like that. You lose everyone. You lose yourself. But I had a lot of respect for Joey because even though the boys did this to her she still had a piece of herself that wanted to forgive them she wanted to believe that they weren't in the wrong even though they were she gave them a chance to just admit that what they did she just wanted to know that they felt some sort of guilt 
but she had no hatred towards them. And she was calm when she went to talk to them. She didn't completely attack them, but they made it seem as if she was the one in the wrong. And I want to touch on the anti-Joey movement that was going on on TikTok a while back. Yes, Joey is a performative activist when it comes to stuff like racism, but it comes from a place of being uneducated, not ignorant. She doesn't understand the full power in her words. I mean, she was so shocked that people were following in suit of the free nipple movement at school because of her Instagram post. She was shocked by how her words got Owen and Jason into really big trouble. I hope if there's a season two, they play more into that. I want to see her become more aware of the power she holds and learn how to use her voice properly without overpowering others. I also want to see her and Dominique's friendship evolve. I think they complete each other and could really help each other grow as people if they got closer. And come on, think about how iconic these two would be if they were best friends. Now, let's talk about the symbolism of Grand Army. The first symbolism we're going to look at is the bombs and the bomb threat. The first bomb goes off and that's when everything starts to go to doo-doo for our main characters. Dom's sister gets hurt and now she has to take on the weight of extra work to help her family. Jason and Owen are being punished harshly for simple mistakes. Owen is getting beat up at his new school. Whilst Jason is mentally struggling with the should I protest or should I keep quiet thing. After the bomb goes off is when Joey's essay takes place. After the bomb goes off is when Rachel and Layla start to fall apart. After the bomb is when Sid writes that essay that eventually leads to his inner struggle and to him being outed. And then we have the bomb threat. See the bomb threat was just in the name, a threat. No bomb actually went off and that's when things start to resolve. Jason plays at Allstate and then he protests for Owen. Dom's mom calls off the marriage and Dom is allowed to be with John Ellis and they get to go to prom and she can just be a teen. Layla sort of rekindles with Rachel and she gets the guy and the other guy and she seems to have found a new sense of confidence that she lacked in the beginning. Joey finds a way to channel her hurt and pain into something great and begins to do what she loves again, dancing. Sid comes to turn with who he is and rekindles his friendship with Victor and apologizes for his reaction. Another sense of symbolism is Layla's cartoon. At first, I didn't know what they could possibly stand for, but now it sort of reflects her selfishness and her main character syndrome. All the cartoons are centered around her and her being the hero, and how she thinks everything is about her. They're also centered about her and her being the victim, and how everyone is against her. These cartoons only show up after a scene where she feels like she's losing control or is feeling powerless. These cartoons represent her reclaiming her power when others have done her wrong. And connecting this back to the bombs, Layla felt as if she lost control of her everything when the bomb went off, and it wasn't until she sent that fake bomb threat that she felt like she gained her control back. The fact that these scenarios are animated further symbolizes the fact that they are fake and she feels as if she can't achieve them in real life. There's also symbolism through Joey's clothes. At the beginning of the show, we see her dressed in bright clothes and tight-fitting clothes, clothes that make her stand out. During the lockdown, she wore a yellow and green shirt with booty shorts. Then you had the bright orange beanie. And then in a couple episodes later, she was wearing this polka dotted sweater, which had pink and blue polka dots. The last time we see her dressed up in bright colors was when she went to the movie theaters where she wore a red dress. The color red represents courage. And considering that's the last time we see her wear that specific color, it's safe to say that the courage she once had was gone after the cab scene. The rest of the season, Joey wears various grays and dark colors. Even her uniform is a plain navy blue and it's big on her. I think the shift from bright, tight fitting clothes to dark oversized clothes represents her loss of confidence due to being so emotionally drained by her essay. It's as if she felt resentment towards herself. She thought that wearing those types of clothes and standing out was what got her into the incident, so blending in would help her avoid anything like that happening to her again. The clothes were a defense mechanism. In the last episode is when we finally see her wearing bright colors again. The color she wears is green. She wears a green sweatshirt with matching leggings. The color green often represents freshness and tranquility, showing how after the confrontation with her offenders, not friends, but offenders, she has sort of come to peace with the situation. Although, she's still wearing a gray shirt, showing that she still hasn't officially let go of the grief she feels, which is totally understandable considering all that she's been through. 
considering that her shirt is oversized and her leggings are tight shows how she's still caught in the middle of standing out and blending in. Although we can't expect her to get back to her old self considering what she's been through, hopefully in the next season we can see her dressed in some more bright colors because she looks so good in them and it'd be nice to see her have her confidence back. Honestly, the way this show was written was so beautiful and captivating. From the main storylines, to the little nuances here and there, to the symbolism. Everything was so good. It definitely captures the struggles of teenage adolescents in America, especially in this day and age. The show also does a great job at touching heavy topics such as racism, sexism, and SA. The way the show ended was very satisfying. All the problems that we see in the beginning of the season seem to have gained a sort of resolution at the end, but there are still loose ends which leaves a perfect segue for season 2. Hopefully there is a season 2 because I am hooked. I hope y'all enjoyed this video. Let me know if you want to see more videos in this format. Please like and subscribe because I worked really hard on this video and I'd hate to see it flop. I love you. Remember God loves you. Peace out and stay lovely. I'll see y'all in the next video.